I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about a host of energy issues, we have with us back one of my absolute favorite guests, Ben Cahill, Senior Fellow of the Energy, Security, and Climate Change Program at CSIS. Ben, thanks so much for coming back now at the end of the summer to talk about gas prices, Europe, et cetera, Ukraine, what's going forward. Thanks, Andrew. It's great to be with you. So, Ben, Americans are finally seeing some relief from high gas prices as the prices you know, continue to fall. Crude is down again today. We're talking about September 1st. Could these falling gas prices be a sign of a recession or a sign of something else? Yeah, the prices have been falling. So the the nationwide gasoline price is now below $4 a gallon, which is definitely welcome news for drivers. And they've been dropping pretty consistently over the last couple months. So you can see that at the pump. You've seen the numbers dropping pretty consistently. There's a lot of reasons for it, but I think in general... The fears of a recession in Europe or the United States are really starting to affect the oil market. And of course, gasoline prices here in the U.S. reflect global market conditions. So a lot of economic concerns in Europe for reasons we're going to talk about. There is a concern about a slowdown in the U.S. And in China, you you still have a zero COVID policy, pretty severe lockdowns, and that's translated into much softer oil demand. So for now, the price has dropped quite a bit to the point where you actually had the Saudi energy minister complaining about a week and a half ago that you know there's a ton of volatility in the oil market. They didn't see it as justified. That was a bit of a warning shot to the market, I think, that if prices kept dropping this way, at some point, OPEC Plus will step in. But for now, welcome news for consumers, for sure. Yeah. And you mentioned China. You know, China has just announced that they're going to lock away 21 million people as part of their COVID policy in Chengdu. That means that nobody's using gas during that time. Right. And yeah, I mean, there's been a pass through effect, I think, on uh, economic growth, on industrial demand, definitely on people moving around as lockdowns have happened. All that means lower oil demand. And Ben, you've written recently you know, this really terrific column that we can find on CSIS.org, a plan to lower gas prices and maybe help the climate as well. And you talk about the strategic petroleum reserve. Can you explain some of what you said in this column? Because I, I found it to be really fascinating. Well, there are not that many things that a U.S. president can do to control oil prices or or gasoline prices here in the U.S. But one of the options that's available is to use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And the Biden administration has done this pretty aggressively. In, In fact, they've done it in a way that we haven't seen before. In March, I believe, the Biden administration announced that they were going to have this huge SPR release, you know, up to a million barrels a day. And that really has had a big impact on the market balances. Uh, We're talking about real numbers here. Those are barrels that have been released onto the market every day. And it means that U.S. crude oil exports and petroleum product exports to the rest of the world have ramped up quite a lot. I think this has actually helped Europe quite a bit. I mean, this is a time where Europe is really trying desperately to get off imports from Russia. But it was a pretty tight market. And the fact that the U.S. has consistently had these SPR releases over a period of months, it really has had a big impact on the market. Now, It's running out. So the SPR releases, I believe, are scheduled to end around the end of October. And the Strategic Petroleum Reserve has really dropped to such a level that I don't really think the White House can do this again. You're kind of running out of arrows in the quiver. There's definitely plenty of oil still in the SPR to protect against hurricanes and disruptions. I mean, that's really what the SPR was created for. Natural disasters. Natural disasters, yeah. I mean, hurricanes that would affect the refining complex and the Gulf Coast, anything that would have kind of a a short, sharp, you know, impact on on oil supply. Um, I think the reality is, you know, the market has changed. Uh, The U.S. is now the world's largest oil producer. It's a big exporter. You know, it's hard to rationalize needing 700 million barrels, literally, of oil sitting in the ground. And what the Biden administration decided is, look, we should think a little bit more strategically about how to use the SPR and leverage it to to affect the market. There was a lot of skepticism when Biden did this, but I think that he he has showed that, you know, this is one big card that the U.S. can play. Again, I think we're kind of running out of the, the period where that's viable. Inventories are now so low from the SPR that we really can't continue to do this without creating some concerns about 
you know, having a sufficient buffer. So at the end of October, I don't expect that there's going to be another wave of SPR releases that will follow. And it is hurricane season. I know this acutely because I have one of my sons at Tulane University in New Orleans, and we're just praying nothing happens on the Gulf Coast. But but it but that's real, isn't it? It, it is real. And definitely one of the huge issues in the oil market is that inventories around the world are much lower now than they have been in years past. Demand has been pretty resilient. It's rebounded in a big way since COVID-19. And supply really hasn't kept pace all that well. So you've seen a big decline in oil inventories around the world. I mean, the whole system is running hot and there's not really a big buffer. So the market does worry about this a lot and you can't just continue to run down inventories without having a real impact on market psychology and prices. So let's talk about Europe for a second. The Belgian energy minister warned that the next five to 10 winters in Europe will be terrible unless the EU swiftly moves to impose a price cap on runaway gas prices. What is a price cap and how could it lower energy prices for European consumers? Yeah, the whole issue of a price cap is complicated. So let me just take a step back to start things off. Beginning last summer, natural gas prices and electricity prices in Europe started to soar. And this is at a time when basically Russia stopped supplying as much gas on the short term market to Europe. And we saw an incredible run up in, in natural gas prices, you know, well before the Russia Ukraine war. So TTF, or the Tidal Transfer Facility, is kind of the main gas hub in, in continental Europe. You know, between July and December of last year, basically gas prices quadrupled, and they've continued to rise to just ever higher levels since then. And in recent months, you know, TTF prices have just gone haywire. It's gone, you know, to 180 euros per megawatt hour to above 300 euros per megawatt hour last week. I mean, just to put that in context, in terms that maybe more people can understand, that's the equivalent of about $500 per barrel of oil in energy equivalent terms. So just unprecedented right. price levels and huge volatility. And the thinking in Europe is that there's really no physical justification for this. I mean, these prices have gone crazy and you can't really justify this kind of price climb and this kind of price movement because of actual physical changes in the market. So there's been more and more emphasis in Europe on trying to look at the market and redesign the market to kind of cut this volatility and insulate the electricity sector and power prices in, in Europe from this kind of huge swings in the natural gas price. So coupled with that, we do have the war in Ukraine, which is disruptive to Europe to say the least. And, you know, winter's coming. And so what is Europe facing this winter, you know, immediately right in front of them? It's a potential crisis for sure. I mean, Russian gas supplies to Europe have dropped by a huge amount already. So in years past, Russia supplied about 45% of the EU's gas imports, about 40% of total consumption, far and away the largest provider of gas. You know, for a lot of countries, it's even higher dependence than that on Russia. And we've seen a big drop in natural gas supplies in recent months. So the Nord Stream pipeline was just shut down yesterday for three days for quote unquote maintenance, unscheduled maintenance. But even before that, it was operating at 20% of capacity. So starting in June, there was a huge drop in Russian supplies. And this is due to political games. You know, there are lots of pretexts that are used about maintenance and turbines needing to be repaired and fixed and examined. You know, it's really just about blocking Europe from building its gas inventories and preparing for the next winter. And it's Russia trying to maximize its leverage now. So already there's been a huge drop in supplies. Now, what Europe is trying to do is prepare for this winter by refilling inventories as much as possible. So the EU-wide target is to replenish gas inventories to 80% of total capacity by November 1st. In Germany, it's even higher. It's a 95% target. As of a couple of days ago, Europe already met this target. So gas inventories are already 80%. The problem is that's not enough. You know, 80% might be fine, if you're in a situation where you have continued Russian gas flows, but we don't. What Europe has to prepare for now is a total cutoff of Russian supplies. And in that kind of scenario, you could refill gas to 80%, 90%, even 100%. It still not may, may not be enough you know, to prepare the continent for the winter. In Germany, for example, you know, one of the state agencies just estimated that even if gas is at 100%, that's probably only enough for about three months of winter demand. So it's still an all hands on deck mentality where Europe is trying to locate as many gas supplies as it can, 
buying LNG from the United States, looking at alternative pipeline supplies, and really trying to cut demand as much as possible. So are they going to make it? And, you know, I guess a separate question is, can we sell them LNG at a, at a fair price to help them out? We're, we're asking a lot of them, of course, they're our allies. And they're the ones that are, you know, right directly affected this winter. You know, certainly we've had our issues. You know, I was just in California and gas prices are still really high in California relative to some other places. But, you know, what what can we do to help the Europeans? Yeah, we basically have brutal market forces at work. I mean, because the prices are so high in Europe, the continent is already sucking up all available LNG capacity. And a lot of that is coming from the United States. So in the first five months of this year, I think about two thirds of US LNG supplies were flowing to Europe. It's a huge change from years past. A lot of those volumes that may have found a home in Asia are going to Europe instead, just because of the price signal. So you don't really need you know, political moves to make that happen. It's kind of the market doing it on its own. But of course it's happening at a very high price. And there are really limits to how much more LNG Europe can get from the United States or other suppliers because it's a very tight market. So I think what's happening is, on the one hand, Europe is trying to set emergency plans to try to reduce gas demand as much as possible. The EU-wide suggestion was that every country try to cut its gas consumption by 15% this winter, which is very ambitious and a really hard thing to do. Yeah, I was going to say, is that is that doable? And like, what what does it take to actually do that? Well, it's quite painful. I mean, the priority is to keep homes heated throughout the winter. If you really have to cut natural gas demand to that level, you're facing difficult questions about, you know, potentially how to ration gas for industry. Again, because of the price impact, you know, you're already seeing a huge impact on, on natural gas demand. So in Germany, for example, it looks like in July, gas demand from industry dropped by about 20% over the previous year. Uh, and that's not good news. That's bad news. This is the sign that the industry just cannot cope with these prices. I mean, they've risen by 15-fold since last year. That makes it up like 500% or something like that? Is that right? Yeah, even more than that. I mean, based on the prices in recent days. So German industry is really struggling to pay these prices. And you're going to have a natural decline in consumption as a result of that, that that will be big. European governments and the International Energy Agency have really encouraged people to use less gas in their homes, to turn the thermostat down, to conserve it more. You know, the continent as a whole is looking at trying to improve interconnections so the gas can flow from one country to another as quickly as possible. In Germany, the government is racing to build regasification terminals so they can import more LNG from the United States. Germany failed to build regas terminals, which was a big mistake. They're now trying to correct that as fast as they can. I think they've commissioned five regasification terminals. They're hoping to start up the first of these by the end of the winter. This stuff takes time, though. You know, it, it's not going to be deployed in November or December. Maybe the first one will come early next year. But it's not an immediate solution. Uh, and it's a situation where governments have to pull every lever that's available to them. And so this will affect ordinary people in Europe how? They, they may not be able to afford their gas bill or what? They may not be able to heat their homes or is it more than that? The critical element of natural gas prices is that they really set electricity prices in Europe. So gas is the, you know, the base load fuel. You need it to provide that consistent, reliable, on-demand fuel source. Renewables are intermittent, as everyone knows. And so what that means is that the natural gas price really sets the electricity price. It's, it's the so-called marginal uh, supplier. And because we've had this enormous run up in natural gas prices, you know, electricity prices have soared and everyone pays the price for that. Households, industry, you name it. And this is why in the EU, there have been recent proposals to try to look at the gas market and try to prevent some of this volatility in hub prices and spot prices, but also potentially to restructure the electricity sector to delink it somewhat from natural gas prices. So the gas is not the dominant factor behind driving electricity prices, and you can delink them somehow. So Europe only gets about you know 20% of its electricity generation from natural gas, but gas has this really critical role as the marginal supplier. So policymakers in Europe now are trying to come up with proposals to delink the two a little bit so that 
Electricity prices are not just at the mercy of these incredibly high natural gas prices. And EU energy ministers are meeting on September 9th. Some of these proposals are just leaking out, but that's going to be a big focus of discussion. Yeah. So I was going to ask you about that. So one thing is a price cap has been proposed by some as a measure. What, what are some of the other things the ministers will focus on on September 9th when they meet? The, these are the EU energy ministers. What are some of the other things they're going to try to focus on? Or that you expect they will? I think gas and electricity is actually going to be a huge focus of that meeting, as I understand it. So just to treat those things one by one, I mean, first to try to deal with the volatility in natural gas prices. There are some proposals to try to cap the volatility in, in spot gas prices in Europe. You know, there are a couple ways you could do that. You can make it harder for just paper traders as opposed to the actual physical traders of, of gas to take part in that market. You could have a daily cap on price movement so that you know the market kind of gets shut down each day if the price moves you know above and beyond a certain band. I don't know how that's going to work, but there's definitely a sense that the the natural gas market is broken and that we need some sort of intervention to prevent this kind of volatility in prices. And then the second issue is really to try to delink gas from electricity prices, um, and those are the proposals that I think will be the main focus of that meeting next week. And. What are some of the longer term solutions Europe might have to really deconflict itself, cut itself off from Russia? I view this as a medium term quest to try to reduce Europe's dependence on Russia from all Russian imported fossil fuels, whether that's natural gas or oil or coal. And it's really not something that can be achieved this winter, but it's about preparing for this winter and coping as best as they can and accelerating this progress so that within five years, you know, there'll be a fundamental break in the energy relationship between Europe and Russia, and they won't have to go back, and Russia won't have such influence over what happens in Europe. To me, one of the interesting elements of all this is that inevitably, this means that governments are just intervening in energy in a way that we haven't seen before. You know, We're talking about things like interventions in natural gas markets, electricity markets, the oil market with the proposed, you know, embargo on Russian crude and petroleum products, price caps, state takeovers of politically sensitive energy assets, you know, Russian linked companies, and market management, I mean, stepping in to try to control demand. You have to keep the lights on. And this means that, you know, no matter what your political orientation, you have to step in and, and, and try to prevent these really negative impacts on consumers around the continent. Um, it definitely means that Europe is taking a different path than the United States or other countries, you know, uh, with much heavier state intervention. But I think it's inevitable. To me, one of the big challenges is how do you pull this off financially and politically? You know, how do you keep up this, you know, emergency response in the preparation for this winter, while still trying to keep up the momentum behind the energy transition and shifting away from fossil fuels as fast as possible? You know, Europe is trying to do both. They're doing the emergency response, but they're still trying to, you know, not only maintain the momentum with the energy transition, but actually double down. And for a lot of EU policymakers, this is just proof that they have to get away from fossil fuels as fast as they can. And the only way they can insulate themselves is going to be to grow renewables and do more of this at home instead of being dependent on, you know, imports. So long term, this could be a plus for the environment if all goes well. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to see a silver lining from this situation because it could potentially be pretty brutal this winter. And it's not just a 2022 issue. It's really going to be a medium term challenge, as you alluded to earlier. And this conflict isn't, doesn't seem like it's ending anytime soon either. No. And when you think about trying to remove an actor like Russia from your energy system, it's just not easy to do. I mean, Russia is the world's largest oil exporter, if you count you know, crude oil and petroleum products. It's the critical natural gas supplier to Europe. You know, cutting Russia out of the system is something that I think there's pretty strong consensus Europe has to do now. There's a pretty fundamental break. But the impact is going to be really hard to deal with this winter and, and beyond. I mean, if you want to put a positive spin on it, it's that it's really lit a fire under policymakers to do everything they possibly can and coordinate on all these issues. And the, the pace of policy action from the EU is like nothing we've ever seen before. You know, there's 27 countries in the EU. It's a consensus-driven organization. You need unanimous consent behind a lot of big policy measures. It's hard to do that. But the scale of this crisis means that things are happening much faster now. 
Ben, thank you so much for these insights today. Extremely valuable and helping us all understand what's coming. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be with you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 